Thank you so much for having me. Um, and especially thanks to Diane and Cliff for, for making it work to present remotely, uh, despite the, the in-person conference. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to share what we've been doing with Sucho this last number of months. So I'm Quinn Dombrowski. I'm an academic technology specialist at Stanford in between the libraries and the division of literatures, cultures, and languages. Um, my background is in Slavic linguistics, medieval East Slavic linguistics, um, which is, is a laugh line in like half my talks. Um, but very strangely, it's, it's ended up, you know, this year uh, been the year where kind of all of these pieces that, that I've worked on, um, you know, from digital humanities to the medieval Slavic, um, you know, to technology of, of various sorts and working in central IT for a number of years, um, all came together through this project. So Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online is uh, a group of over 1,300 uh, friends and, and new friends, mostly from North America and, and Western Europe, who came together in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February um, to try to protect Ukrainian digital cultural heritage. Um, to be honest, um, we didn't really know what we were getting into when we started this. Um, but as we worked on the project, you know, we discovered how quickly, um, you know, Ever since World War II, there are many organizations that exist um, specifically for the purposes of protecting cultural heritage. Um, you know, there's Europa Nostra, there's the Smithsonian that's been involved for, for decades. Um, but there are very, very few players in the space of protecting digital cultural heritage. And over the last 30 years, um, the amount of effort that has gone into creating digital cultural heritage through digitization of um, physical objects, to websites, to born digital things um, is, is immense. And these are materials that, that need um, you know, care taking during a war as well. So here, here's how it all started. Um, it, it, it feels sort of um, sad and ironic now, um, you know, how much of Sucho, especially in the early days, depended on Twitter, uh, the, the academic scholarly communication infrastructure that you know, is, is now um, on fire, metaphorically, at least, if not literally as well. Um, Anna Kias, uh, who is a music librarian at Tufts, posted on February 26th, just a couple days after the war started, um, she wanted to organize a data rescue session focused on music collections. She was at a, a music conference, and that was kind of her immediate community of folks that she could bring together to, um, you know, archive websites that had a fair amount of, of music content. And Sebastian Maestorovich immediately replied um, from the other side of the world at the uh, Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage in Vienna, Austria, um, suggesting that a uh, web recorder might be a, a tool that might be useful for this context. And I saw this and we all got together and had a meeting the following day. And just a couple days later, we launched Sucho, um, where Sebastian had paid out of pocket for server space to be able to start archiving sites um, around the clock uh, using the, the web recorder suite of tools. Um, and we, you know, as, as one does, we put out a Google form for people to sign up to help volunteer. And all of a sudden, you know, we were being flooded with, with volunteers. Um, you know, over 400 people signed up to help in the first, uh, you know, couple days, even as we were still setting up the Slack. Um, we were writing tutorials. Honestly, I had never really done web archiving before this project other than sending things to the Wayback Machine. Um, and so, you know, we were, we were learning these tools ourselves for the first time, writing documentation for the next people who would be learning them, you know, minutes after we ourselves had, had figured out these things. This was our, our web archiving and collaboration toolkit. Um, we were gathering links from all kinds of different sources. Um, you know, we were using Wikidata, we were having people send us links, we had a link submission form. And we would send things in two places. Everything would go to the Wayback Machine. We would check to make sure that it had been archived before and we had volunteers go through and make sure that the, uh, the capture was thorough and, and caught everything, even the sub, sub, sub pages. Um, and for things that were missing, we would have them submit new seed URLs to the Wayback Machine to make sure that those were captured as well. Um, we were also having people use the web recorder suite, um, which is available as a browser-based plugin, um, as a Docker container, um, and eventually we were the, the first prototypers of Browser Tricks Cloud where people could do automated web archiving in their own browser. Um, for a lot of, of our volunteers, we had a number of volunteers from, um, you know, libraries, archives, museums, universities who had some experience with kind of cultural heritage technology. Um, but we also had a lot of people who um, had never tackled that kind of thing before or, or similar to me had only used the Wayback Machine. 
Um, and so our, our tutorials and video guides and hands-on sessions um, were used to, to train people to install Docker and run things on the command line sometimes for the first time. And um, it was amazing how with a little bit of coaching and support, um, people at, at all kinds of um, kind of self assessed levels of technology um, were able to, to pick this up and work with it. We were communicating around the clock via Slack. We had a, a free Slack instance and we got a, uh, an extension of our, our free trial actually until November. Um, and that, that has been our, our hub for communication, um, you know, synchronous, asynchronous around, around the clock. Um, sometimes we would hold Zoom sessions, but honestly, most of the project um, communication happened on Slack. And Google Sheets was, was, you know, perhaps the unsung hero of this project. We had um, this gigantic spreadsheet um, with multiple different columns for all the links that we were getting in. We would set the status there. Um, we would have information about where it was hosted. Initially, we were prioritizing sites that were physically located in Ukraine um, with our, our primary threat model thinking of, um, you know, missiles and physical destruction of servers. Um, it turned out over time that we, we stopped doing that and we would take any site that was related to cultural heritage, even tangentially. Um, you know, we had everything, not even just libraries, archives, and museums, but also, you know, children's after school programs where they were learning Ukrainian language and, and cultural heritage. Um, you know, train museums for, you know, teenagers to learn to be train conductors dating back to the Soviet era. Um, even fanfic sites, um, anything that are, you know, it, that represented places where people were engaging with Ukrainian cultural heritage. We wanted to make sure there was at least one or two safe copies of, um, you know, distributed, uh, you know, using our, our browser tricks tools and also in the Internet Archive. Um, it turns out, as I was saying, that, you know, physical destruction was actually not our biggest problem. Um, it, it turns out that of the sites that are hosted outside of Ukraine, refugees are not great about paying their server bills. Um, completely understandable. There's a lot of priorities. Um, so there were sites that were hosted, you know, that were not in any sort of physical threat that went down due to um, non-payment. And so we wanted to make sure that we could capture as many of those as possible as well. Um, we, we did some creative things with trying to find sites. Um, you know, in addition to talking with subject area experts, like the Bavarian State Library, for instance, gave us a giant dump of Ukrainian uh, URLs that they had curated um, we also went to Wikidata, but it turned out that a lot of things that were in Wikidata um, were out of date or the domain names had lapsed and the sites were now, you know, gambling rings and things like that, um, sometimes more, more uh, audacious even. Uh, so we, we had to go look for a lot of sites. Um, we didn't know what all was out there. And we had volunteers, especially those involved in situation monitoring, like Erica Peasley, who would um, look at the air raid alerts that were going out on Telegram and then look within those regions, actually walk through the streets using Google Maps of cities under attack, looking for the cultural heritage icon, and then finding, you know, are, do those places have a website? And if so, um, she would add it to our list. Um, the, the situation monitoring also fed into our prioritization, where generally we just sort of went down the list um, with anything that hadn't been flagged as a problem or spam or things like that. Um, but when there were um, active attacks going on, uh, she would sometimes reshuffle the priority list saying, okay, focus on things in this region or focus on things in this city, um, knowing that those websites might be the only, uh, you know, remaining traces of some of these institutions that were being destroyed, even as we were archiving their websites. Um, it really was a, a digital Dunkirk effort. Um, you know, Dina Strong, one of our, our volunteers who spent, you know, these 12 hour days, you know, taking vacation off of work to help wrangle the community uh, came up with that phrase, and it, it really is apt. We would we would crawl on any device that could possibly crawl, um, and this this included even Raspberry Pis. Um, we had a volunteer figure out how to run the the browser tricks uh, crawler on a Raspberry Pi device, and wrote up some instructions, and they're they're now on our websites. Uh, people were dusting off laptops that they hadn't used in years, and plugging them in, you know, wiping their hard drives so that there was space, um, and and archiving you know on on those on those computers. We, for a number of months, stored all of our data on Amazon S3 using some free credits that Amazon um, Central Europe provided for us. Um, we also had a number of uh, mirrors at research institutions within the US and Europe, um, including ones that we never really spoke about publicly to ensure that there were multiple copies of this data, um, even if some of our, our data sources were compromised. Um, in the end, our, our goal is to give this data back to the institutions if their websites are destroyed, if the institutions are destroyed, you know, extracting the data and helping them 
um, you know, reimagine and rebuild after the war. And so we had to make sure that, that the data was going to be secure. Our volunteer pool um, really ranged the, the whole gamut from uh, children to retirees. Um, one of our volunteers sat down with his five-year-old and to, to archive a website and, and um, he, he asked his child to, to draw what they were doing as they were archiving the website, as you can see in this, in this picture here. Um, this is on, on March 17th. And, um, you know, the, the success of, of that experiment that he did, you know, got me thinking like, I, I too have young children. Um, I wonder if, if they could get involved. And of course, um, you know, I, I live in Berkeley. Uh, it's a very sort of, you know, socially active uh, community. You know, the, the kids have been talking about the war in school. And so we, we hosted what, what I think may have been the, the first ever um, web archiving event at a, a, you know, for the PTA of an elementary school. We, we had the event over Zoom and, you know, everyone was there with their laptops. I had curated a list of uh, children's libraries for the kids to go through and families got together and were able to help in a tangible way by, by archiving websites. And this is my, my uh, now nine-year-old Sam here in, in this picture. One thing that we discovered over the, the course of this, this project is that, um, you know, key GLAM infrastructure is really poorly adapted for web archiving. Um, you know, there were, for instance, um, I, I now have this fear of calendars on websites because event calendars, it turns out, um, are essentially crawler traps um, where you're, you know, they automatically generate links to past events and future events even when we're talking in like the vast distant future or the vast distant past where there are absolutely no events, the calendar will create, continue creating pages and uh, web crawlers will keep going through those pages and not actually get to the content of the site because they're too busy time traveling. Um, Irvis is a major library catalog system uh, that is, is, has been widely adopted in post-Soviet countries um, developed in Russia. And it is a nightmare to crawl. I mean, you functionally can't. And so what we ended up doing was uh, one of the grad students at Stanford, Georgi Karakov, wrote a web um, scraper to be able to deal with Irvis library catalogs. And these were really essential because um, when libraries are damaged or, or destroyed, we want to be able to have records of what their holdings were before the war, you know, both to try to get that data back to them, um, if we can find copies of these books um, you know, or have them donated from, uh, you know, people in the US, um, you know, professors with libraries, or you know, figure out a digitization strategy to get them some copy of the book in some form back. Um, but you know, this had to have a special um, you know scraping method to be able to get that data. As did DSpace, unfortunately. Um, uh, you know, while there was not a lot of adoption of some of the other um, widely used standards, like IIIF, for instance, in Ukraine, we were we were actually very happy to discover that there were not IIIF servers that we could find um, where we needed to back up that data. Um, but DSpace had been fairly widely used for, you know, academic publishing, um, for, you know, archives and, and libraries and galleries. And it is incredibly hard to uh, web archive DSpace with the tools that we have. Um, so, you know, some, some food for thought for, for future development, I think. We have the Sucho Gallery and Equipment Fund. At, at some point, we realized that, you know, archiving websites is, is all well and good. Um, but it's limited in its impact when there's so little of the country's cultural heritage that's been digitized. According to the Ministry of Culture, less than 1% of Ukrainian um, cultural heritage holdings have been digitized. And so we've been, um, you know, raising funding and working on getting equipment, um, you know, to Ukraine. We have partners there who are developing tutorials um, in Ukrainian for how to use these materials, how to upload things. We've developed the, the Sucho Gallery, which is a Nomeka-based uh, platform. If people need, need somewhere to put these materials so that they'll be visible to help raise funds for these institutions. Um, one of our biggest partnerships right now is with the Cherkasy Regional Library, where they had um, an art contest for internally displaced children. Um, they wanted to digitize all of this art and turn it into an exhibit that could travel around the world um, to help raise money uh, to support the community. So we, we managed to get them a, a book eye scanner. It's on its way to them. They have a, a lower end um, Caesar scanner right now. And we're working with them to try to like help lay some of the um, pedagogical infrastructure to be able to duplicate this for other regional libraries and other places that are maybe not on the same uh, high priority and high profile level um, as to receive the kinds of international support that they would get otherwise. Um, this is just kind of fun. We, we also have a meme wall. Um, we, we realized at one point uh, in the spring that 
you know, memes are in, in some ways kind of like, you know, letters home from the war or letters within a community from a war um, for this particular crisis. Um, and the historians of the future, um, as, as much as we, you know, sort of see them scrolling in our feeds and we, we laugh and we move on, historians of the future are going to want this data. Um, and so we've started uh, curating a selection of these memes, um, kind of anytime there's a big event in the war, there's always this, this outpouring of memes. Um, and, and we've been trying to capture those across multiple different languages, add metadata, um, and, and make it possible for people to browse those. Um, unlike the websites where we, we're really seeing this as something that we're doing for the Ukrainian cultural heritage community, and that data, you know, will be their choice about whether we keep them or, or get rid of them after they have their data back. Um, the, the memes we really see as, as a resource for, for future historians. And already we have students working with this material, um, both in Ukraine and in the US. We are also part of these conversations about the building of a future National Digital Library of Ukraine, uh, which primarily is a partnership between you know, UNESCO and the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine um, and the Ukrainian uh, Library Association. Um, but again, you know, Sucho has found itself in this weird place of of we end up being the people in these conversations um, thinking about the digital stuff. So, um, you know, it, it's a, a you know, multi-governmental effort. And so, you know, naturally it's going a little bit slowly, um, but we're, we're looking forward to um, helping advise on this one in the future, um, thinking through what the National Digital Library might look like. Already we're talking with the Ukrainian Library Association about setting up their own um, D space <laughs> as it happens um, for their own internal materials. Um, as a way for them to kind of get their their hands dirty with um, kind of building archives and thinking about what that looks like to run them in the long term. The situation is is actually worse than ever for Ukrainian internet. This is the uptime of the sites that are on our list um, starting in April and running through now. Um, and there was a while where we were thinking like, you know, maybe we didn't need to do this. Maybe actually there won't be any data lost um, because, you know, while there's some degree of of fluctuation with any given site on any given day, um, the sites were mostly online for much of the war. Um, and really, it is only within the last few months that this has changed dramatically. And in fact, the risk to the sites that are at least hosted in Ukraine um, has also increased dramatically um, because of power shutoffs. So, um, you know, unplanned power shutoffs can lead to data corruption. Um, you know, the, the risk of data loss is, is really higher than ever. And I think it really underscores the need for us to, um, you know, not not give up and not, you know, call this a done effort. This is something that we, um, you know, kind of need to be in for the long run until the community is is ready to rebuild. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Sucho, um, our website is sucho.org. Um, you know, I, I we definitely need help with a variety of things, um, including the gallery, including some metadata. Um, you know, we could always use some technical help um, as we're thinking towards some of these bigger projects with the National Digital Library of Ukraine. Um, and at least speaking for myself, um, I'm incredibly grateful to the support that I've gotten from Stanford libraries uh, to work on Sucho. This was literally all I did for, you know, two or three months. And now I'm balancing it with everything else that I'm doing. Um, but the, the experience of working on Sucho has um, led me to get involved in web archiving more broadly um, within Stanford libraries and thinking through what the future of that looks like for a variety of different use cases, um, you know, including web archives as data um, and, you know, sort of preserving these manifestations of, of cultural heritage for the future. Um, so yes, thank you so much. Thank you for having me remotely. Um, and I look forward to your questions. Um, now I'll turn it over to part two. And I guess I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen so that you can just do thank that. Thank you, Queen. Uh, yeah, if, if, thank you. So um, if there are any quick questions about this talk so far, um, perhaps this is the time to ask. Um, she'll hopefully be around um, at, uh, till the end of the talk. So if you have more detailed questions, we can address it at the end. Yeah, I'll, I'll be here. We, we can do the questions at the end if that's easier. Yeah, uh, say it again. You say something? Oh, uh, we can do questions at the end if that's easier. Okay. I, mean, I mean, yeah, if there were any clarification or smart questions, we can perhaps uh, uh, go with that now, otherwise, we can wait to land. <clears throat> All right, so paging through this far. Hello, uh, I'm Saud Alam, uh, a web and data scientist uh, uh, of Wayback Machine at the Internet Archive. And um, uh, at, 
at the Internet Archive, we were fascinated by the, the work um, Quinn and team did to kind of, you know, establish this uh, hundreds and eventually thousands of people kind of, you know, rallying uh, uh, behind and kind of, you know, collecting all sorts of seeds and reviewing stuff and finding all sorts of ways of archiving the, uh, the web. And Mark Graham, uh, the director of the Wayback Machine, said, hey, let's go and help them. Um, uh, and f find out how we can learn and uh, uh, more and how we can help. Uh, um, so basically, um, um, uh, many developers from our team, me, um, Mark Graham, we, and, and some other uh, members of the Internet Archive, not necessarily working for the Wayback Machine, they all joined Sucho's uh, Slack and said, can we help? <laughs> <laughs> Sucho actually stress tested Save Page Now service of Wayback Machine by sending a lot of data to us. Um, and, and the person maintaining uh, uh, Save Page Now service is coming back and kind of, you know, okay, so this is down. Okay, I'm going to fix this. Go ahead. Maybe uh, we can take more load and, and whatnot. So at the Internet Archive, um, we are a library and we do. Uh, 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 the task other libraries do, like collecting stuff, preserving, lending it material, collaborate with other people, um, provide access to the data we have, uh, make data discoverable by making it uh, in, indexed in, you know, uh, searchable and whatnot, and provide uh, helpful services on top of it. So this is um, Sucho collection at the archive.org, and this is not the web collection. Uh, there are all sorts of books and videos and audios, images. Uh, you can find many things in here. Um, but then uh, Wayback Machine team started kind of ingesting uh, data, the, uh, the, the spreadsheet that, that you saw before, um, into Safe Page Now. Um, I mean, we did not uh, consume it like one uh, entry at a time, but we, uh, Safe Page now comes with many different APIs. You can submit data to it using emails or uh, Google Spreadsheet. Um, uh, you can submit one by one. There is an, an HTTP API that you can use to interact with. There is a browser extension. So many different ways to, to go about it. Um, the Sucho community, some folks from there actually created an add-on uh, 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 that made the, the Google sheet-based workflow even uh, better and easier. <clears throat> then um, uh, some other uh, tools that members of Sucho team were kind of using to archive the web locally, not using Internet Archive to archive those, uh, they were creating WAXZ files. And there are about five, uh, 50 terabytes of those. They were sitting in Amazon S3. We are in the process of moving that and uh, making a copy into um, uh, Internet Archive's uh, Petabox. And um, these are WAXZ files, not the traditional WARC files. So these are actually a wrapper around or a container of WARC files. Um, our system is not quite ready yet to, to ingest it as is, but we have experimented with that, and, and hopefully soon uh, we'll be able to serve WAXZ files uh, um, <coughs> through Wayback Machine or in other ways. So um, as we browse the web, we sometimes see things that we realize like, oh, I wish I, would, uh, I should have archived that. Please do, right? Uh, if you see something, save something. <laughs> yes, that's the motto of uh, Safe Page Now, which is a service of uh, um, uh, Wayback Machines, Safe Page Now. Uh, if you go to web.archive.org, somewhere in the middle there will be a, a place, there will be a form that will say save, or save page or save page now. Uh, use that. And not just Wayback Machine Safe Page now, there are other web archives that are uh, um, providing services so that you can archive pages there. Please archive in multiple places, okay, to have more diversity. <coughs> um, Internet Archive runs uh, um, uh, a subscription service called Archive-It, where um, different organizations, those who don't want to have their own web archiving program in-house, uh, but they do want to have web collections. Um, uh, they can subscribe to our paid service, basically, um, of Archivit. And we internally use it sometimes. Even the Wayback Machine team uses it. Mark Graham created two collections here, which is like a news colon Ukraine, news colon Russia. And it's collecting uh, a bunch of seeds there and uh, periodically archiving those. 
Um, and over time, we have uh, collected more than three, three million um, um, you know, captures from Ukrainian uh, sites and 24 million plus captures from Russian sites. But perhaps it's not surprising to the audience here that the archiving just a seed list is not enough. And archiving the first few hops grows exponentially. Here, one seed from CNN.com resulted into 31,772 captures. So how it happens? You get one page, and you archive the HTML of the page, but you need JavaScript, you need CSS, you need hundreds of images in there, and over time, there are more and more resources per page. So you archive all those, and you get that 338 embeds, basically. Then you process that page, and you find how many hyperlinks are there. And those external links, in this case, come out to be 174. Then you go download all those, and all those pages will have page requisites, like images and CSS and JavaScript and whatnot. And then you get this big number. That's how it expands really uh, uh, quickly. Now, um, archiving regular static pages is easy. We have been doing it for a long time. Uh, but how about archiving Facebook or Twitter? or Telegram, or what a number of other services. Sometimes we uh, use traditional tools and it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but when there is a crisis and there is important material there, we try hard to get it uh, done, even if it needs more engineering and specialized tooling around it. Right? Um, so, um, so it turns out there is, a, um, there is a page on archive team, which is a volunteer-driven archiving community that's been around for quite some time. Um, they basically were up to this task, and they went to this um, uh, platform where there are um, channels of uh, Russian and Ukrainian, Belarusian, and, and other places, and they got data from there. And they started collecting uh, 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 those specialized engineer, way, engineer ways to download uh, um, Telegram data from there, uh, and we started ingesting that uh, uh, that content to Wayback Machine. And this is a dashboard that we have, which where we uh, see on a daily basis what's going on in our different uh, um, collections. And so far, it's been 22 billion Telegram URLs archived. Um, then VK.com, which is basically kind of a Facebook of certain country, um, that has its own challenges, and we started archiving that as well. So there are 3K regional groups with daily snapshots since May to, uh, 2022, about 5 million posts, and about 200 pro-war groups uh, with daily snapshots. So we were archiving it aggressively there. Then saving Russian independent media. Um, there are a bunch of uh, independent media uh, uh, sites there, and we wanted to archive and preserve that. So we collaborated with um, Bard College and pen.org uh, on that task and we are archiving um, those sites as well. And here is the dashboard of that, which is, so far, it's 140 million plus URLs archived in that one. This was about 70, 75 or so initial seed that we got uh, of um, you know, independent media sites. We don't know uh, uh, which sites are independent media there, but there were experts uh, who helped us on the other side. Um, and that's why collaboration at every stage kind of you know, helps. <coughs> Um, then, then we started collecting the data. Now they want to have access to uh, the data that we archived. Um, and we have been experimenting with something called collection search in Wayback Machine. So the, the amount of data that we have at Wayback Machine is, is enormous. And um, indexing it is beyond our uh, uh, computational capability at this point. We cannot make the whole thing full text searchable. So what we are uh, doing now is like we are uh, identifying smaller collections or things that we think like there is an immediate uh, um, you know, um, usefulness to make it available uh, in more ways and more, make it more discoverable. Um, and we index it, full text search, uh, index and make it available. So now if you go to web.archive.org, there is a collection uh, search option. You can search for uh, govdocs in there, like you know, uh, end of term crawls that we have made it available. PDFs from GovDocs, uh, those are indexed. In fact, PDFs from all the other sites are also indexed there. Poetry.com is indexed. Uh, that site is not there anymore. Uh, 
and a bunch of other collections. Basically, I think there are like 15 plus uh, collections that are available now, and this number is growing. So um, this Russian independent media collection that we have built, uh, that is also now available. Hopefully, going forward, all the Sucho uh, uh, data that we have collected, that will be indexed and that will be available as well. Uh, it's not there yet. <coughs> so this index that we created, not everyone is going to access it from Wayback Machine interface. So we have created an API for that. Now, if you are a researcher and you want to put like a UI around it um, with some of these collections that we are exposing, um, you can certainly access that. Um, and this work was, again, um, uh, a fruition of um, collaboration with Media Cloud folks. Media Cloud is an organization that collects um, news seed data from all around the world in many different languages. And uh, they give us like a, a daily uh, um, feed, and we archive those URLs, and we index it and make it available. <coughs> so um, Archive It uh, has also been supporting multiple partners, and some of them are creating collections on Ukraine or Russia or uh, uh, these war-related collections. Um, now, we got these <laughs> URLs, and um, when Wikipedia has become like one of the uh, knowledge sources, um, and URLs die quickly in there, especially in country, countries or, um, uh, that are in crisis. If you go to Wikipedia of, you know, in Russian or um, um, Ukrainian languages, the URLs there are more vulnerable to, uh, uh, to, to disapp disappearing than, than some of the other Wikipedias, right? So we um, um, increased our activity on those uh, wikis to kind of you know, fix those links before they break, or once they are broken, we just change it to uh, uh, Wayback Machine links. And for that, we have a bot. We call it Internet Archive Bot that periodically goes and kind of you know, checks all these wiki sites, uh, which runs on several hundred wiki uh, sites uh, on a daily basis and fixes links. <coughs> So what it does basically, right? Uh, here you see there is a, a, um, a references at the bottom of the Wikipedia page. Uh, some of those links, if you uh, click on those, they will lead you to a Wayback Machine page because the original link was broken. It's not there anymore, right? It's 404 or the site is down or something. And here's a little dashboard that we have. Um, so we have recently crossed like 15 million um, links fixed on Wikipedia, all the wiki pages uh, combined, and by the end of the year, we'll cross uh, 16 million mark, uh, which is a, yet another arbitrary number, but it's a huge one. So basically, we have um, um, made sure at least those many million URLs uh, in Wikipedia, they will live, the, the references will, will stay and readable in, uh, even if the origin uh, site is down or gone, or the content is changed. Here is a monthly activity of our Internet Archive bot on different wikis, and here we're comp comparing Russian wiki and Ukrainian wiki and English wiki. So in the early days, the blue line shows, like, I mean, the English wiki had more activity than, than others, but towards the end, uh, uh, February 2022, and so, uh, so much activity was kind of, you know, uh, uh, gone into Russian and Ukrainian wiki, and now it's gone have to calm down and gone to the normal speed now. So that was the website of things, right? And um, how about television? Um, we, we have started archiving um, television as well in uh, a lot of, um, we have a specialized uh, interface in, in, in the Internet Archive when you, when you go to TV News Archive. Uh, and if the news has corresponding captions, they will be available. Uh, you can browse through it and read through it or interact with it. Um, so this is TV, TV News Archive, and you see a Fox News uh, um, um, thing here with the captions. But Russian TV generally has no captions available. So it, it makes it more difficult to understand what's going on in there just by seeing um, titles that to a language that uh, not many people might understand. So this is a TV Visual Explorer, and this is uh, a work from GDEL project um, where it processes TV news and um, transcribes the text, uh, the, the first basically converts the uh, uh, speech to text, transcribes it basically, and if necessary, uses translation tools to make it more accessible to users not knowing the language. And also it creates periodic snapshots, like takes thumbnails and 
puts them into like a, re, uh, a strip like thing where you can see what's going on like uh, have like a visual overview of of a news um, even if you don't understand the language and if you click on one of those um, thumbnails it will land you to the internet archive um, uh, on that particular recording at, at a, uh, a specific time so you can watch from there and the transcripts will be available there it's, it's kind of an, an interactive system um, and we are doing it uh, for all the Russian, Belarusian, and uh, Ukrainian TV. <coughs> now there are, um, with this system in place, uh, GDELT has been experimenting with a lot of other um, um, projects around this. Uh, uh, when you have like the TV data collected by the Internet Archive and they can ingest it into their system and do all sorts of machine learning uh, uh, things there. <coughs> so um, what kind of um, um, you know, um, value-added services you can, you can provide with that. Um, GDELT's um, uh, projects blog is, is an excellent place to, to follow uh, what's going on in this space. Here is TV Rain. The, that is a, a Russian independent TV um, was shut down for a while. Um, and we got um, disks from them shipped to us. We loaded it. This is Mark Graham's office basically copying data from those disks into our um, uh, archives. And it made it into Internet Archive's data box. So now you can browse through and access it, uh, uh, those TV rec recordings. <coughs> now, we got that data and we passed it to uh, the same Visual Explorer we, we talked about before. So now it is more interactive and accessible, basically. Um, then we also archived uh, Echo of Moscow, which is like a Russian independent radio. Um, uh, we archive their content. It's not a web archive, it's a regular um, uh, audio archiving basically, or radio in this case. Um, then um, we collected Ukrainian books, basically there was a call for that on our blog, um, and people were donating books and we were organizing um, uh, you know, those collections. Um, here is something called Better World Books, uh, which is like a, uh, where you can um, buy used books basically and a cheaper price. Uh, that is a subsidiary of the Internet Archive now, um, a nonprofit. So what we do is every time there is a reference in Wikipedia for a book that we don't have in the Internet Archive, uh, we add it to a special list, uh, which is our wish list basically, and every once in a while we send that list to Better World Books, and they, when they find those books on their uh, conveyor belt, they basically put it uh, on the side, um, and then we send it over for digitization so that we, uh, we have those books. So it is our kind of long-term goal of making Wikipedia more resilient and references that are there in Wikipedia that are not web references but books and uh, other non-digital materials, um, how can we make sure that those references live and be accessible in the future? Um, <clears throat> then as we showed before, uh, when we have a copy in Wayback Machine of a web page, and if that link is broken, we go and fix Wikipedia page uh, to point to Wayback Machine link or any other archive link, basically, in um, uh, non-internet archive uh, archives. But we, since we also have books and other materials, we can fix those references as well. There is no broken reference uh, to begin with. It's just that if there is a book citation in a Wikipedia article, uh, how to go to that book, basically. Now, sure, you can have a library nearby, and if they have that book, you can go and find that reference. But Internet Archive is a library that is accessible, so why not link there, right? So we try to identify uh, such references and link to the page number. So now, if there is a book reference uh, in, in a Wikipedia article, you can interact with the, with the link there, and it will open it uh, to a book reader that Internet Archive has at that page number, so you can uh, access those citations that way. Um, so yes, it's, it's, a, it's a whole involved process. We, we um, uh, acquire these books, we digitize those things, and uh, we make it accessible uh, in many different forms, and we also kind of, you know, where things are cited, if we can uh, create a link there, we do that as well. And this is uh, kind of an open problem because some books will have um, hard references like DOIs or ISBNs, so we can have like a, one-on-one -on -one matching, but uh, sometimes uh, the citations will not have those, that rich metadata available. And in that case, um, we need to find more reliable ways to, to link more books, basically. 
So with that, uh, we can conclude, and if uh, um, um, we can take any uh, questions, but I can uh, go through all the things that we did. Basically, um, we supported Sucho.org uh, 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 when there were only like a few hundred uh, volunteers in the beginning. Uh, 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 that 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 group or basically organization. Uh, we started archiving Russian and Ukrainian news sites um, and other websites from those uh, uh, countries. Archiving Telegram, archiving VK.com, saving Russian independent media uh, with collaboration uh, um, uh, in collaboration with Penn.org and Bard College. Uh, we have many archived projects uh, that are around um, uh, war-related sites. Um, uh, then we are also uh, working on Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian TV uh, material um, with uh, with the help of uh, GDELT project. Um, those are excellent folks up there. Um, then we are also archiving and, and saving independent TV, like TV Rain, um, independent radio, which is TV uh, uh, Echo of Moscow. And we are always looking for more uh, uh, resources that we can archive and make it available in the future. Um, and we are enriching uh, Russian and Ukrainian uh, Wikipedia sites. Um, um, I think um, uh, Quinn perhaps can summarize uh, the work on her side, and then we can take any questions from there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Um, All right. <laughs> so, any questions? How much time do we have? About 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I'm not sure how you're going to relate this to Quinn. I'm not sure if Quinn can, can hear the a AV here. Mm -hmm. um, First of all, I just want to thank the Internet Archive and everybody who was involved in Sucho. It was a project that was personally pretty important to me. Um, I'm curious about what the lessons learned are. Like, so I remember a few years ago with um, a CNI event, they were talking about the dashboard that evolved at Johns Hopkins for COVID data. And there was discussion at that event, like, well, how do we prepare to present this sort of data or to react to a crisis like this again in the future. Obviously, a crisis of this magnitude isn't impossible. Um, we're going to continue to have data online in this fashion. So what, what lessons do we learn from the Sucho or Internet Archive experience in Ukraine that we can carry forward? Sure. Quinn, uh, uh, were you able to uh, hear that? Or do you want me to repeat it? Um, no, no, I, I was able to hear that OK. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that we learned, um, you know, very quickly with Sucho is that, you know, for a situation like this, you really need a balance of, um, individuals kind of acting on their own volition, um, and institutions that are ready to, um, kind of like step in, uh, kind of on a slower ramp up pace. Um, I mean, realistically, you can't expect institutions that, um, you know, are, 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 are thinking about things for the long term um, to be able to react as quickly as necessary in a crisis um, to start gathering this data. I mean, this really is the purview of, of volunteers who, who need to start going and doing this. Um, but having organizations, you know, like libraries and archives, um, you know, maybe have a plan in place for like what to do in this kind of crisis. You know, how do you get in touch with the people who are volunteering and doing this kind of work? Um, to support them, be it through mirroring or through longer-term archival storage or for help with curation efforts. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, um, you know, both in the short term and in the longer term um, for institutions. And I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure institutions are necessarily, um, have been thinking about this kind of uh, work as, as part of kind of a global emergency preparedness effort, um, but it might be putting some thought into, um, you know, how you want to, uh, liaise with uh, kind of volunteer groups that, that spring up to respond to these crises um, in order to be able to support that work and ensure the preservation of the data in, in a medium and longer term. Yeah, so to add to this, basically, um, you actually hit the, the title uh, uh, nicely. I mean, that's what the, the, the objective of this talk was. Perhaps we were, we were trying to encapsulate that. Maybe, um, uh, I don't know how much justice we, uh, we were able to make, uh, do, but but my personal observation is we really need more Queen. <laughs> yeah. Honestly. And uh, 
thank you. Uh, and it's not surprising because soon after that, uh, there was crisis in Sri Lanka, just like a small country. Uh, um, um, and I personally tried to reach out to a bunch of people that I knew that were basically originally from there. They are in the comfort of uh, living here in the U.S. and you know, thought maybe they know what is important for them, what needs to be archived, and if they can help. Um, they didn't step up, basically, and I understand their priorities might be different, but we, so, I mean, that's where I think, I mean, there needs to be more motivated people who know uh, um, what's going on. Again, um, and within this year, there are more events. Uh, uh, um, you know, the, um, Iran is going through <laughs> some crisis and what is happening there. Um, we can see some things, we can archive some stuff, but when there are curtains around it, uh, unless someone is inside and somehow the data can be transferred in a reliable way, how are we going to kind of you know, preserve those things? It's, it's an open challenge, it's a very difficult one, um, honestly, and kind of you know, chasing through. Some different communities use different platforms, for example. If you are in India and in some other countries, they're using a lot of stuff on WhatsApp, okay? Not a platform very common here, but in some uh, places they will be using Telegram more often than not, or um, there are some decentralized, uh, um, uh, you know, chat softwares that they use where they communicate and express how to, um, you know, penetrate into in a, in a safe way without hurting anyone's identity. Those people are at risk, basically, and we need to be very mindful about it, right? And, and, then, and then archive that material uh, uh, in a meaningful way. Um, we certainly learned a lot of lessons from, from this, uh, like, you know, the kind of infrastructure of preparedness and, you know, or, or making sure that things are indexed and uh, made available to researchers as soon as possible. Um, oh, those would be some things that we can uh, uh, carry forward. But yeah, we need more volunteers, more motivated people. Again, uh, from Internet Archive side, we are there to help. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you both for those presentations. And hello, Quinn. Good to see you. Um, the question I'd like to ask you is, how do the lessons that you've learned apply to how we may respond to climate change? And by we, I wonder, academia as well as nonprofits like the Internet Archive. Yeah, that's, that's a hard one. Um, I mean, that, I think the, 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 the climate change questions, um, you know, really challenge some of the underpinnings of our assumptions about um, you know, what we have and what we will have and what we will have access to and how we um, engage with those things. Um, I mean, on one hand, you know, I absolutely like no regrets with what we've done with Sujo. I think it's, it's essential, um, you know, to have done this work. Um, but in, in the longer term, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think like, you know, digitize everything and everyone will have access to it always everywhere is, is going to be realistic. I mean, I think you know, thinking about, you know, portability of data in ways that don't assume, um, you know, a functioning global internet or, you know, the, the sort of pre-echoes that we're seeing in Ukraine right now, like what happens when people don't have power reliably? Um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll admit that kind of on, on the spectrum of, of digital humanities folks, like I've tended to be, um, you know, less into the minimal computing. I, I, don't, I don't think that we can, um, you know, static site our way out of our impact on, on climate change, but, um, I mean, at the same time, like these these questions are real about, um, you know, what what is what is the future going to look like when we don't have, um, you know, reliable power necessarily or reliable access to data. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't I don't have any answers to this other than, you know, there's there's the things that we need to do now. But like we also need to be thinking more creatively about kind of what the future of cultural heritage looks like. And honestly, maybe it's going to be more analog um, or it's going to be differently digital, um, you know, portable in, in, in ways that we can have access to for certain periods of the day where we have access to power um, or electronics. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting and creative things happening in the makerspace area um, with this these days. Um, you know, thinking about data in different ways, um, you know, data physicalization and things like that. Um, the the um, Digital Humanities Center at Princeton has done some interesting things there. Um, but but yeah, um, I mean, I, I think, I think Maybe the, the big takeaway from Sucho when it comes to climate change is kind of how far you can get by getting a group of people who care about something together um, and to combine their, their creativity and resources um, to go do a thing and, and the things that we will need to do 
um, to ensure access to some kind of, of data, um, you know, assuming a, a future of limited power, electricity, connectivity, um, and travel are different, but um, that, that, that same kind of human ingenuity and collaboration, I think, is, is the same. Yeah, and at the Internet Archive, I mean, this is this is a growing concern everywhere, right? And and I think we collectively are still kind of you know understanding what's going on and what can be done. Uh, um, I mean, a lot of people were in denial mode that this uh, this thing exists. That is changing, which is a good news, I think. Um, um, but it came with a hefty cost <laughs> uh, of a lot of people not believing in in it in the beginning. Uh, also, I mean, so the data sources. Um, Especially when I think uh, um, from the perspective of we being like a memory organization, right? Uh, preserving the lineage and, and the history of the data is important to uh, to assert the change that has happened. Without knowing the past, you cannot say something has changed, right? And um, it is sad to see some of the uh, government-funded organizations that were hosting, uh, um, you know, climate-related data. And, uh, I forgot the name of that uh, the site right now. They basically announced that they will be, they won't be maintaining the data anymore. Basically, and you know, so we need to jump in and kind of you know archive as much as as we can uh, and make it available uh, in a in a meaningful way. Um, but there is another perspective to it. While we are archiving, we need to be mindful of not causing more harm into the system. After all, archiving is nothing but it's it's another digital or or uh, computational infrastructure that we have. And if we tomorrow start like, hey, let's Index the whole web as best as we can. Maybe that will uh, uh, come up with a with a hefty carbon footprint, right? So, so how to do it efficiently and smartly without harming the system? And uh, is I think um, it's a it's a it's a process that we are still learning. Uh, so with that, I think uh, uh, we ran out of time. And thank you so much for your questions. Uh, thanks, Quinn, for joining remotely. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank, thank you, you for so much. Me. All right. Bye bye.